So uh, it's been over a decade, can you believe it's been a decade? Since affordable, put big air quotes around that, affordable 3D printers have become available. Most people expected a massive revolution in the 3D printing industry. They've predicted by now every house would have a 3D printer. And when you wanted to buy something, you would simply buy it online and your 3D printer would whir and it print spit out in the next room. Uh, well, gee, I don't think we're quite there yet. So some of the questions I want you to think about is, have any of these expectations been met? Uh, how about the predictions? Have they come true? Is there a 3D printer in every home? Can you order online and print out? Well, it turns out with MakerBot, you kind of sort of can for a very, very narrow kind of thing. Uh, they have their own 3D printing design library that you can buy, and then it will download it and print directly on your MakerBot printer. So kind of cool that way. But you, know, you can't buy a new coffee maker and have it print out for you. That doesn't work. <laughs> So, consumer versus professional versus industrial. It's kind of sort of about the price, but not exactly. Uh, consumer are those affordable types. Again, air quotes around that. <laughs> but they're mostly for the enthusiast or the hobbyist. You know the difference between an enthusiast and a hobbyist? It goes like this. A hobbyist says, gee, I'd like to get into that. An enthusiast says, oh, look, there's another one. I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. So, owning at one point, uh, an embarrassing number of 3D printers, and now I'm down to five. I'm <laughs> in the enthusiast category. Uh, but the, so the consumer printers are largely d governed by their features and price. You know, what's affordable to the average person kind of thing. Professional, on the other hand, tend to have more features. Typically, they're bigger build areas, so you can build bigger things with it. And they are usually higher cost, not always though. And they're made for longer prints and longer life of the printer. Industrial, on the other hand, goes even further. Those are the, the big monster machines that they use for CAD CAM design, a lot of prototyping, sometimes even producing real parts. Some industrial uh, printer companies will print your parts for you. So if you've got a really cool part, you want to print it in stainless steel, you can get them to do it. It's not cheap, but they'll do it for you. Um, so they use typically exotic materials, uh, very expensive, and they're built for heavy-duty industrial use. Did I mention they're expensive? <laughs> We're talking in tens to hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of dollars here for these things. But this talk, I'm going to talk about consumer 3D printers. I won't talk a lot of bit about professional 3D printers, but when I talk about the vendors, I'll show you some examples of vendors that have professional quality uh, printers. So are they a commodity? Well, that depends on how you look at it. The answer is no if you'd expect to be able to buy them in any Best Buy or your electronics store down the road. They're not there yet, um, unless you're near a reseller, and there are precious few resellers. If you live in Southern California, there's an excellent one that I'll talk about a little bit. If you're a DIYer, you like to, you're a maker or something equivalent, IoT enthusiast, something like that, you can build your, buy your own parts online and build your own 3D printer. It's not, diff not overly difficult to do that and their parts are plentiful. Like most uh, hobbies, knowing what parts to buy, what parts to avoid, <laughs> is, is the real trick there. So it's kind of sort of yes and no. Uh, where are we now? Well, um, one of the great proponents for 3D printing, a company called PrinterBot. Everybody heard of PrinterBot? See, they've only been gone almost a year and almost nobody remembers them. <laughs> PrinterBot was famous because they really did produce affordable printers. They had a $300 printer that was built with laser-cut plywood. It, it worked fairly well. I've had a couple of them. They work pretty well, uh, especially if you upgraded them. Uh, you spend some time with them, you get some pretty good quality out of them. They switched about two years ago from the laser-cut plywood to powder-coated metal, and it raised the price two and three times. So their niche of affordable small printers went away. It's a very un unhappy business decision there. So they're gone. Some of the smaller DIY part gatherers, the 3D printer kit companies, they're gone. And there's no surprise there. <laughs> some pundits, some people who look out there, the 3D printing industry have claimed or they continue to claim that 3D printing has seen its better days. And that it's just a, uh, a fad, it's, it's uh, you know, had its time and it's done. The hype is over. Uh, the startup is gone, uh, nobody cares anymore, feature expansion 
has slowed considerably. We're not seeing these Jesus features. Like most products when they first come out on the market, they come out and they're pretty basic and they work and then somebody has a new feature and it really improves things and it goes on from there. And uh, so they're saying, well, we've reached this plateau. We don't see anything new with 3D printing, so therefore it's dead. Uh, they point out that you still have to fiddle with the 3D printers to get any working. Even the best ones you buy don't work out of the box. And there is some truth to that, uh, but um, we'll talk more about that. There is some good news, though, about where we are now. The sales from the big vendors, the, some of the vendors I'm going to talk about today, they're very strong. They're going quite well. And they are improving their products and becoming better every day, or I should say every year. Uh, there have been some improvements in the years, recent years, but not the meteoric rise that we've seen uh, in the past decade. Uh, filament quantity, the, the plastic that you feel, feed into these printers was a big source of problem for a long time. Uh, when you were to buy filament, sometimes you would buy filament that was inexpensive, only to find out the quality was so bad you couldn't use it after half a roll. Okay. Either it was exposed to humidity, or it was dried out, or the diameter of the filament varied through the through the roll, which caused major problems with uh, print quality. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of problems with that. Uh, the field of vendors has narrowed considerably. You used to be able to go out on eBay, say, five years ago, and see some pretty good kits out there. And uh, um, I don't know what happened, but at some point, a lot of those went away. And now you see very few kits. Most of them come from Asia. Um, but the 3D printing for the consumer is still alive and well. You can buy, uh, you know, name brand printers that work very well from companies that support their products. Uh, the kits that you buy typically don't have any support. <laughs> With one exception, I'll show you. Uh, current challenges. The, the challenges today for modern printers or the, the, the newest printers is uh, still around the one thing in particular, the build plate material. Now, you have a build plate where, you, where the 3D printer builds the, the part, but on top of that, you usually have some sort of treatment, something that will allow the filament to stick to for the, for the part to form. Those build plate materials that I'm talking about is where we have a lot of challenge right now. There is no one solution, no one solution that's going to work for every kind of filament or for every printer, or for every vendor's printer even. So some people have these voodoo-like performance experiments where they say, well, you gotta, gotta use this, and it's gotta be this particular hairspray from this salon, don't get that Revlon stuff. And uh, it works this way, you gotta put it on, make sure you flow from left to right, like you're painting a bicycle. You know, no forward and backwards, gotta be left and right. I'm not kidding, that's how a lot of people read. If you look out on the internet, you'll see that. And they'll say, you got to do it this way, don't let it comp, you let it comp, you got to do it over again. But they fail to, to point out that that material, or the hairspray, they're spraying it on top of another piece of material. They rarely mention what that is. Is it glass? Is it steel? Is it captain tape? Is it something else? You know, they don't mention those kind of things. So you'll see all kinds of articles out there about the best new treatment. Don't listen to it. <laughs> No one treatment is going to work for you. You're going to have to do your own experimentation uh, to figure it out. Some other challenges for 3D printing is uh, ease of use is a, is a big one. A lot of times you buy the printers and let's say you've, you've read some material or something and you've, or you've got some friend to help you and you learn about it or maybe you've worked with them in school or whatever and then you get one, you get it home and it's great, everything starts working and then something happens and it, you can't figure out why it's giving you this error. Why isn't it printing? It's just blinking at me. Yeah. So ease of use is a big challenge. Some vendors do better at that than others. Uh, so you have a very much a right out of the box, your mileage may vary experience. I've talked to people, they've pulled them out of the box, they plugged them in, turn it on, they printed a whistle. You know, within 10 minutes they had a whistle, everything's great. And I've talked to people that say, well, I had it, I bought it in September and uh, well, I got a bunny, but I can't get the whistle to print. You know, it's, it's, it really is, it's like that. Um, you've got to work with it, and I'll talk more about that. Filament availability and stability is getting a lot better. It's not quite there yet, but it's a lot better. Uh, one tip is if you buy a printer, 3D printer, from whatever manufacturer you buy it from, if they make their own filament, buy it. So if you're 
if you're into MakerBots and you find the MakerBots, buy the MakerBot filament. Uh, you know, it's just, it just works better that way. Um, even if they do have quality issues, you can call them up and say, hey, it didn't work, send me a new reel, and they will. Uh, so uh, another area, the quest for the best extruder. <laughs> now that's the part that actually heats up and melts the filament and pushes it through what we call the nozzle or the hot end. Uh, that extruder, sometimes including both the cold end and hot end, have had uh, a lot of development in recently. Most of the major vendors like Ultimaker, Lulzbot, uh, Prusa, they use pretty much their own designs, but there are a number of uh, 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 different nozzles and, and hot ends and, and cold ends that you can use. Uh, E3D makes a very good one for your DIYers. In fact, I use that exclusively on any printer I build. Um, but there are some really strange extruders out there. You have to look at them. Um, here, here's a little pet peeve for mine. <laughs> Anybody know the difference between an axial and radial fan? Axial and radial fan. Okay, one's like your house fan. It spins around, right? Another one's like the fan in your HVAC. They have different properties. They don't do the same thing. So when you want to cool something in a general area, you use the actual fan, the radi the, you know, like your house fan, it just blows air. If you want to precision guide it or direct the air, you're going to want to use a radial fan. So when I see these new extruders with actual fans on them for part coolers, it makes me cringe because they, they're not efficient. You want radial fans. Okay? It's not one of those cult things, it's just one of those people are not aware kind of things. So what they do with the actual fans is they put a duct on it. <laughs> So there's got this cone thing on it that directs the air. You don't have to do that, folks, if you buy a radial fan. <laughs> okay? That's its job. <laughs> but, so there's an example. Uh, print speed. Print speed is still a challenge. I think it's going to be a challenge for another decade coming. It really is a challenge right now, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, so at this point, you're going, wait, what's a 3D printer? You're talking about a hot end, build plates, actual movements. What, what is all that? Well, that's an excellent website from matterhackers.com that it gives the anatomy of 3D printer. Or if you find a book that talks about 3D printing, they'll tell you all about 3D printers and all the parts that go with it. Um, I could probably spend two hours talking about that. <laughs> but, so let's talk about the vendors, the leading vendors. I'm not ranked them necessarily, I just list the, the leading vendors. These are the top six vendors that I think Anyone who's interested in 3D printing would probably want to check out one or more of these. You know, some of them have different types of products. Okay, some of them are, offer kits that you can build yourself, which are, can be very rewarding if you like to tinker with things, like to build your own things. Um, and they have excellent instructions, otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, recommend them. So the first two, Ultimaker and Lulzbot, and uh, well I have to include MakerBot, they make printers that are fully assembled. And you, you don't buy those as kits. Uh, Ultimaker makes uh, their own brand of printer. They're one of the early uh, vendors. They um, have perfected their printer. They have a very particular style. You'll see that in a moment. Lulzbot is another one. That's, that one's, oh, Ultimaker's in Europe. Uh, Lulzbot is in the U.S., in Colorado. Uh, they have a very uh, unique frame that they've created. It works very well. They are also one of the vendors that were around early on. And their printers actually resemble uh, DIY printers more than any of the others. So they haven't spent a lot of time on aesthetic, aesthetics, as I'll talk about in a little bit. Prusa Research, Prusa, uh, Joseph Prusa, or Joseph Prusa, was one of the guys who created one of the original 3D printing designs, uh, 3D printer designs. He created his own company, Prusa Research. You can buy fully assembled printers from there or kits. Uh, that's interesting. MakerBot was another one of the first uh, uh, 3D printers out there, but uh, they got a little bit of bad rap because at one point they were open source and they were bought by Stratsys and they closed sourced everything. <laughs> so uh, though their printers are among these printers that I'm, I'm talking about. Theirs is the least modifiable. They have gone, I'm talking 180. It used to be you could tinker with them, do anything you want with them. Now the only thing you can do with them is change the extruder and you have to buy their extruder or build plate, and you have to buy build, their build plate. There's almost nothing you can change on a MakerBot to improve it. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. <laughs> CME CNC is well, probably the smallest vendor here. 
And they make Delta printers. Now, what's a Delta printer? Uh, most 3D printers that you see are Cartesian, meaning they, their axis movements follow the Cartesian planes. A Delta printer has three actual vertical actual movements connected to its center uh, part, let's call it, uh, and as those arms move, it moves that part or the head around in three-dimensional space. They're a wonder to behold. They're, they're fascinating. When you're printing, you find out, you know, you're looking at, staring at it, watching your part, and you realize, wait a minute, 25 minutes have gone by, I really should answer my boss's email now. You know, that kind of thing. So they're, they're kind of neat. This last vendor is an interesting vendor. It's, I call it a 3D printer superstore. Matter hackers, they don't make their own printers, but they sell everybody else's. And they sell parts for them. They sell their own filament. They even have their own 3D printing software called Matter Control. They also service them. So you can, they're a one-stop superstore. You can get everything you want. You, you want that Alka maker, but you want a su support with it? Call Matter Hackers. Yeah, whatever you want. Uh, and they have a, a wide variety of printers they sell. Let's look at some of these. Ultimaker. These are what the Ultimaker printers look like. Uh, the one on the far right, Ultimaker 2 Plus, uh, it's their second series with three parts in it. That's why they call it 2 Plus. They used to have a mini, but they, they stopped making it because it didn't sell very well. These uh, printers typically use three millimeter filament. Uh, the bill plate is glass. They do have a heated option. Um, on the left is their professional series, the Ultimaker S5, not 5S. <laughs> I guess they didn't want to be associated with Apple too much. Uh, but it's the S5. Uh, they also make their own software called Cura. And actually, the Cura software is used by a lot of people. It supports more than just the Ultimaker printers. They have an interesting thing with the 3. They may have added to the 2 Plus. I didn't check. Their extruders uh, have cartridge designs. So you can snap them in and snap them out, which means if you want to change the nozzle size, you can have additional hot ends that you just pop in there that helps with different types of filament. They're pretty neat. A lot of people swear by Ultimakers for a very good reason. They're very stable. Uh, these are their, uh, incidentally on these slides, or this is their hype from the website. And it's all true except when I tell you it's not, okay? <laughs> uh, all right, low spot. This is what the low spot printers look like. They look more like, you know, serious get it done type printers, and they are. They're very robust. They, they are uh, really workhorses. Um, they're used to, in a conferences past, someone would bring one here and have it at the conference. They'd have the little mini, the one on the left, and uh, they would work and they'd print parts for you right before your eyes and all that, and they, they, just, they just work. Um, interesting thing is they, they are upgradable, whereas the Ultimaker are upgradable, but the Ultimakers are pretty much ready to go. Those are too, but if you want to use exotic filaments, add a second extruder or something like that, Lulzbot makes parts for those. Now their big workhorse called the Taz on the right, it's a little expensive. It's closer to what I would consider professional grade. So their consumer grade is more than mini, but you can't go wrong with the mini. It's a very, very good printer. Uh, and then there's Prusa Research. Now they make two types of printers right now. Uh, one is, I would not consider it a consumer printer. Their, their mainstream printer is the i3 or iteration 3, Prusa i3. If you were to look at some of the kits out there available on eBay and other uh, sites, you'll see i3 appear again and again. That just refers to the design. And the design is one where the X and Y, ac uh, excuse me, the Z axis is on a vertical plane, which is usually heavy aluminum. So it's the the black square frame there. And uh, so the Z axis would ride on that, and the X and Y is on its own little carriage uh, on the bottom. That's a very distinctive design. Um, one thing I don't like about this design is you see how the spools are at the top? Okay, unless the Z plane, the, the big thick aluminum, is mounted, is very strong, and it is on the Prusa, by the way. The, from Prusa Research, this is good. From some of the clones, that is going to cause a wobble. It's going to cause X and Y plane shifts. Because as the printer is printing, that big heavy thing way up top is going to start flexing, kind of like this podium does when I move. Okay? Same principle. Um, but again, the proofs of research don't, don't suffer from that. So I'm adding that out to you for those that want to build their own. On the right is their SL1 printer. This is a resin printer that uses ultraviolet light. So it hits the resin and solidifies a, row, a line or a plane at a time. 
those require curing. So you, after you take the part out, you have to cure it. I wanted to show you that to show you that there's more than just the FFF type printers out there. But the one on the right, uh, I think it starts running around $2,000 without the curing equipment. So it's very, very pricey. Uh, but pr you can't go wrong with the Prusa Research printer. And the interesting about those, if you bought a Prusa today and next year they come up with a new model, they will sell you an upgrade kit. So you can upgrade their, their, the whole thing. There's everything you need for the new parts, you can do that. To some extent, Lulzbot does that occasionally as well, particularly if they improve the extruder. You can buy the new extruder and it works just fine. Uh, MakerBot. Now, I started with MakerBot way back when the MakerBot were made out of laser cut plywood. So that goes back a ways. Uh, today, they are, um, they are closed source. They are make a particular printer, like I said, that you, you, know, you can't change anything in them. They're not adjustable to some extent. And uh, you've got to buy their parts. And if for, they sell a lot to uh, education. So educators are used to MakerBot printers because they show up in the schools a lot. The STEM schools have them. Uh, right now for consumer grade, you, on the bottom row there, the one on the right, a Mini Plus, Replicator Mini Plus, that's a consumer printer. And the one second from the left is a consumer, that's the Replicator Plus. So they're different in scales. Replicator Plus is more like a professional grade printer in that it's bigger, but I don't really see it as a professional grade. They, they promote it as such, but uh, because you can't do anything with it, I think you're kind of stuck with it. Um, not that it's a bad printer, but uh, the Z18 and the, the Method are their latest printers. The Z18 sits about, oh, I don't know about this tall. It's a very large format printer. I think I've seen them used around five grand. So <laughs> they're very, very expensive. Interesting thing about the Z18, they have a heated chamber. So instead of heating the bed, it heats the entire inside of the cabinet. Okay. Uh, very interesting, that's how they that's how you can print something three foot tall with that thing. Um, the method on the far left is their professional grade printer, and that's a one-stop thing. It's software, the design, all the things wrapped together. It's really kind of a turnkey thing for like architectural firms or manufacturing and things like that. Uh, spelled expensive. <laughs> okay. uh, see me, see and see. Here's a delta version. Here's what they look like. See me, see and see have three current Delta printers. The one on the left, the Artemis, is a fully uh, assembled printer that you buy and you ship to you. It's about two foot tall, so it's not really a mini, but it, it's a fairly well, it's a fairly small build plate. But the build area of a typical Cartesian printer is some sort of rectangle. Okay, sometimes a cube, but mostly a rectangle. In the case of repli uh, replicators, these are cylinders. <laughs> so the build area is a cylinder for a Delta printer. The one in the middle is their mainstream uh, Rostock Max. Uh, that's probably the best one that they sell. Uh, that stands about three and a half, almost four foot tall with a spool on top. Uh, that is my workhouse, workhorse printer. I use the Rostock for a lot of different things. And then they have this Boss Delta on the right. That's not a joke, folks. That thing is five foot tall. Now, these guys are kind of funny. They bought, to, I wish I was there, but to one of the conferences, they brought a working it's either 12 or 15 foot delta printer. And it was amazing to watch, watch it work. They even made one that prints a ceramic. <laughs> so they're really out there as far as pushing the envelope of what to do. But if you need a big format printer, that Boss Delta, uh, that's gonna do the trick. <laughs> um, and then there's Manor Hackers. I mentioned that they are in Southern California. They sell just about everything 3D printer related, including the books that go with them. So if you want a one-stop shop, that's your matter hackers. Um, so it's a full service experience. You get the whole purchasing experience, getting parts, building, whatever you need. They're there, they'll answer uh, on their form. You can send them email, you can call them up, and talk directly to the guy. Um, I've talked with them, they're, they're really, really good. Uh, and they know their stuff. So a lot of the uh, help materials, blogs and whatnot that you see, you know, go to Matter Hackers. They, they really cut through the chaff and they'll tell you the straight deal. You, know, you don't see a lot of that voodoo stuff I'm talking about. Uh, in fact, they don't even sell hairspray on their website. That's a good thing. <laughs> okay. um, so what about used 3D printers? Is there a market for used 3D printers? It turns out there is. 
most of which is a, usually a junk shop. <laughs> okay. It's like looking for a cathode ray based TV. You know, you, you know, the odds of finding one that's going to work well are pretty low at this point. Uh, but the problem is, is that those gems that you find, the ones that are really worth buying, are overpriced. Most people are asking 80% of what they paid for. Because uh, as a, particularly Americans have this sense that if I paid uh, $2,500 for it, a year later it ought to be worth nearly as much. You know, No, that doesn't work that way. <laughs> In the 3D printing industry, I can tell you, 25 to 33% if you're lucky if to sell your printer. So that's why I still have five printers. I'm not going to give them away, although I have given them away, I should say. So if someone's really interested in 3D printing and they're a friend or an extended family member or something like that, I, I usually eventually give them their 3D printer. It also helps so they don't call me every five minutes. <laughs> yeah. But um, So you shouldn't pay more than 25 to 33 percent. And also consider 3D printers, I would look for ones that you can upgrade. So the kinds of upgrades you can do are like wooden frames can be substituted with steel or, or aluminum frames, better frames for more rigidity. Access mechanisms, the X, Y, and Z axis, can be upgraded to smoother, higher precision uh, components, get rid of drive lash and all that. Build plates, again, that's another area that you can change. Really easy, actually. Heater upgrades are easy to change. Extruders, obviously, you're going to want to change that. And electronic boards. Now, at one point, there were the mystical electronic board that only one worked. <laughs> now there's probably half a dozen or so that work very well. Uh, the big, uh, four years ago, the big thing was whether it was 16-bit or 32-bit. I think most are now 32-bit. So that just means speed. It doesn't have anything to do with comp computational processing. Because, so by the way, the ones run with the old Arduinos, they still work. <laughs> it's, you know, the Arduino would run it no problem. Uh, Arduino didn't have Wi-Fi, didn't have Bluetooth capability and all that, and that's what some of these 32-bit boards add for you. Um, but the best tip is look for one with a solid, reliable frame, like a, um, uh, a one that you, maybe somebody knows what they're doing, somebody you know, but it's a, that took care of it, that kind of thing. Um, and I can give you all kinds of tips if you're interested for what to look for specifically. There are some things to look for. Like when you buy a used car and it's got 5,000 miles on it, but the tires are bald, that should raise a big red flag, right? Well, just like 3D printers, they tell you, oh, it's got about 20 hours on it. You look at the extruder and it's got a, and it's all caked up with burnt plastic. 20 hours, is, it really, is that all you printed? Are you sure? You know, that kind of thing. So what are the best 3D printers? I think the low spot 3D, uh, used printers are good. Uh, unless they've abused them, they're pretty good. And like I say, Lulzbot often sells upgrades. So if you buy a, a Lulzbot Mini, not the Mini Plus, uh, you can buy the parts to make it a Mini Plus. That's really uh, kind of thing. Prusa Research, that's another one. I already mentioned that. Ultimaker printers are good, or used ones, if they're taken care of. Although with the Ultimaker, that's one of the ones that I always see people pay 2500 for, they want 1800 for a two-year-old 3D printer. Mm -mm, don't do that. <laughs> You really got to have one go ahead. but And then the older MakerBots, the MakerBot Replicator 2, I think is a better printer than the MakerBot Replicator or Replicator Plus. The Replicator 2 can be upgraded, and I've upgraded mine considerably. I've upgraded the access mechanisms, the build plate, um, and all kinds of things with that. The only thing I haven't upgraded are the actual stepper motors themselves and the frame. So you can upgrade those, those printers. I have a uh, Replicator 1 still that I use that works very well. CB, CNC, Rostock printers, same way. Now they make upgrade kits for previous ones, but if you like buy a Rostock Max version 2 today, a used one, they're on version 4. You may have to buy two upgrade kits to get you where you want to go, but you know, you could, they still sell the upgrade kits. And if you call them, they're, they're reasonable. They're, they're a CNC shop. So when you call them, you get the guy that does all the CNC stuff for the frames and whatnot, and you say, hey, I got bought a V2 used one. I'd like to upgrade the, this, that, or the thing. Oh, you need to buy this, that, that, the other thing. You know, that kind of thing. So they're, they're interesting to talk to. Older, well-engineered Prusa i3 printers, or the, the build-your-own kind of thing, they're fine as long as they're good quality. Uh, watch out for ones made with plastic or acrylic frames. Those are not good, generally. Some folks have swore by them, and then they get really good quality out of them. But that plastic moving around, <laughs> watching the printer jiggle while it's printing, and uh -uh, that's not for me. 
Uh, beware of shipping containers. <laughs> if you buy a 3D printer, it is, a, uh, an, is an engineering piece of engineering equipment. It's very sensitive to uh, movement. You know? So if you buy a used 3D printer, make sure it comes with its original shipping container. So if you're buying a used DIY printer, uh, you know, what are they going to do? Stuff it in a big box, throw some newspaper around it? Believe me, I've seen them arrive like that, and I've also seen them destroyed that way, so be careful with that. Uh, so some more notes on upgrading a 3D printer. So this is one of the areas I wanted to, to tell you about. Uh, people, people get wrong, and then they, they get their 3D printer, and they talk about folks that come to a conference or whatever, and they hear some things about this, and they read about the new extruder or whatever, so they go out and they buy the new build plate, the new extruder, the new belts, the new pulleys, and they all put it on their printer, and they fire it up, and nothing works. <laughs> Don't do that. It's like software. Change one thing at a time. Evaluate it. And then and, and go on from there. So avoid the latest, bestest, most perfectest upgrading thingy that everybody has to have. There usually aren't all that. In fact, they're usually are not going to work for you. It's one thing at a time. Okay, so areas of advancement. Here are areas that we've seen advancement in the last 10 years. The hot end, cold end extruder. Access mechanicals have become tighter. So the gears are matched to the, if it's belt driven, gears match to the belt better. So there's less lag. Uh, uh, smoother running bearings, smoother rods, that kind of thing. Build plates, different types of materials. Uh, there's glass, metal, there's uh, spring steel, uh, there's all kinds of uh, new carbon fiber, uh, uh, different kinds of treatment. Lullabot uses a different type altogether. Leveling. Now, this is, this is one of those terms that don't make a lot of sense because there's no such thing as leveling. You're not leveling the printer like putting a, ball, a bubble level on it. Level means tramming. <laughs> What you're making sure is that all the axes move perfect 90 degrees to each other. That's what that means. Some printers will level themselves or tram themselves. Okay, uh, that's really cool, and that's one of the new ones. One of the biggest ones of late is failed print restart. So if you're printing something and it's 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 30 centimeters tall, it's a big thing. You get two thirds of the way through it, and something happens. You run out of filament, power goes out, whatever. What happens? It used to be you snapped it off, you cleaned the plate build, and you started over. <laughs> but the new printers, like the proofs of research, will re be able to restart. And the CMC, CNC can restart. And some of the software that you could buy or have open source, like the matter control is open source, they have features to allow you to restart. Some of it requires measuring the part to figure out where it was if the printer doesn't have that capability. But if the printer has the capability to remember where it was, it can resume right for where, where it failed. So that's very nice. Wi-Fi connectivity. You might not think that's a big deal, but if you're printing something that's going to take six hours and you start it in the morning, it's real easy to forget it's going and turn off your computer. <laughs> okay. That you should get. You have direct connection. You've got to have it. It's sending codes to the printer the whole time. Over Wi-Fi, you can let it run and, and ignore it. Um, uh, some of the printers, like the MakerBot printers, have cameras in them, so you can actually watch it remote. You can go on, go on to the store, or go on to work, and check it as it go along, or whatever. Although that's not a good idea to leave a 3D printer alone by itself in your home. Why? Think about it. On average, 230 degrees centigrade heat at the hot end. Uh, you know, what if uh, something were to fall into the build plate or something that's flammable? Would it catch fire? Will the printer itself catch fire? The answer is yes, I've seen it. <laughs> it's not pretty. <laughs> so be careful. Treat it like it, what it is. It's a, it's a piece of industrial equipment. Um, uh, better surface treatments. Again, let's ignore the voodoo parts. But uh, toolless part removal. So it used to be when you had your part, it printed wonderful, it was great. And then you had to risk breaking it, getting off the build plate, because it stuck so well to the build plate. And some treatments today are like that. But toolless means you can take it off without having to disassemble your printer. It used to be you had to disassemble your printer partly to take the part off, and then you put it back together, you had to retram everything before you could print again. <laughs> toolless eliminates that problem. A better exotic filament support. That's interesting. We could print now with flexible filament. So if you want to print a new sole for your shoe, you can. But uh, uh, you have to make sure your extruder can handle that. Not all extruders can handle certain types of material. I have wood filament. 
And so I can print things that actually look like wood. And what's really cool is I can change the, the temperature of the, the, the nozzle temperature and make it look like wood grain. So the higher it gets, the darker it gets, the cooler it gets, the lighter it gets. It's really, really cool. You print little trinkets, you know, um, little bunnies, little owls or something like that. They look like they're made out of wood. You can sand them and stain them. It's really cool stuff. Uh, I have some carbon fiber in, uh, embedded uh, filament that I use for parts that are going to be under a lot of stress. Uh, it's a very strong part, but it's brittle, so at some point it will actually break, but it's very, very strong. Nylon is another example, and a whole host of exotic materials. Uh, but if you want to print some of those, you've got to make sure that the printer you're buying either can be upgraded to print that material, or it can print it out of the box. Prusa is one of the ones that offers an option to print some of those, uh, or an extruder to print some of those exotic filaments. Uh, better quality nozzles. It used to be that when you bought a nozzle, it was a little brass nozzle, looked a lot like, like a nozzle out of a carburetor. And uh, they were, the quality was eh, okay. <laughs> but uh, now we have much more harder uh, material nozzles. They even make a nozzle that has a ruby in the bottom of it with a precision hole dr drilling through that. And that's to, to uh, control the heat distribution. And, of course, surface treatments. Uh, the prize for misunderstanding, the most misunderstood and voodoo-like experience is surface treatments. There's all kinds of goop, ugents, potions, and various liquids that can make parts stick to your print surface for easy removal. All kinds out there. Some people, like I say, have near-religious experience with some of them, and they're convinced nothing else will work. Uh, some, like me, usually have a meh experience with most of it. And I'll tell you, of my five printers, I have five different surface treatments because each printer with the type of material I use on it is a little different. Some have glass build plates. Some I use build tack on. Some have flexible spring steel that I cover with captain tape. Some with glass with blue tape. It all works, whatever works best for your printer. So for example, the Delta printers, the Rostox, glass with blue painter's tape. That's the best for me. <laughs> for you, if you have one, it might be different. I've got several MakerBots, most of the older ones. One of them has, I've upgraded to a removable build plate that's glass. That thing with Captain tape on it will print ABS perfectly every time. Always sticks to the build plate, always easy to come off. If I print anything else on it, I've got to retool it. So I've got one printer that I do ABS, it works great, leave it alone. <laughs> uh, another MakerBot, I use uh, BuildTac, works great. Uh, another MakerBot that I use, BuildTac, same printer, doesn't work very well. There's something really peculiar about the extruder in that particular one. That's one of the newer models, by the way. So your mileage may vary. You're going to have to experiment. Um, don't forget that um, that stuff that you squirt or paint on your surface is only half the equation, right? So you may read about ABS slurry if you're going to print with ABS. ABS slurry is just taking a little bit of ABS and diluting it in acetone and creating a, something you can paint on, like a, like a varnish kind of thing, and it works really, really well. But ABS slurry won't work with PLA. <laughs> yeah, it won't work. It's not designed for that. It's, it doesn't work that way. It won't work with the wood filament or the flexible filament and so on and so forth. Uh, make sure what you're using and using it for the right reason with the right surfaces. So if you've got a surface treatment you want to try out, make sure you research it. Find out whether it's made to be used on glass or whether it's made to be used on top of tape. Okay? Experiment with them. You know, try it out yourself. If you're starting to think, oh, this is going to take a lot of time, you're starting to get the hint of what I'm going to talk about at the end. <laughs> um, so, for example, build tack with PLA. Build tack is a flexible material. It's, uh, it's got, it, it sticks to your build plate, and you can put it on there, and it works best with uh, PLA and uh, my MakerBot and, P and Prusa clones. But it's horrible with my Delta printers. It just doesn't work that well. Um, and uh, there's lots of reasons for that I won't get into. Uh, but here's the real secret. What you need, I don't care what the solution is, even if it is one of those voodoo, uh, hairspray kind of things that has to come from a particular salon. If that works for you, the goal is to make sure that the first layer of your print sticks to your build plate and does not come off except when you want it to. Okay. That's the trick. Whatever solution you can get, figure out that works that way for you, use it. 
So I might look at it funny and go, oh, you're built uh, hairspray. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> but if it works for you, that's great. Just don't preach it like it's the best solution in the world, okay? Promise me that. <laughs> uh, uh, so usually, they, these things people do uh, will help. They make suggestions. They're very helpful out there, but they usually make it worse. So a lot of people suggest, oh, you see, my print's not sticking to the bill plate. Well, just raise the temperature. Uh, well, the bill plate or the nozzle? They say, yes. <laughs> it's not helpful. That will usually make it worse, actually. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not done yet. <laughs> so... Another tip that you can use is to use a raft. So what's a raft? A raft is a, a layer that the printer prints down and usually does it very coarsely. So it's made, designed to be bigger than your part and then and it builds up over time, uh, oh, several layers, usually thicker layers. And then at the top, it prints a very fine surface. And the idea is that you, your part will stick to that very fine surface. Now, some 3D printing software makes a better raft than other. Believe it or not, the MakerBot software makes the best raft because you can go to the part when it's done and pop it right off. Getting the raft off the build plate is a different story, <laughs> but it's done its job. Uh, the Matter Control makes a decent one, Cure makes a decent one, but some of the other software makes a raft that becomes part of the part. And I've actually had to take it, the part off and go in there with a fine exacto. Uh, uh, saw and saw off the raft. That's mission failure, guys. <laughs> Don't do that. But if you've spent six hours printing a part and you can't get the raft off, what are you going to do? So, again, experiment with that. Uh, but be careful. Uh, too strong a bond, whatever, whether you're using a raft or not, can damage the print surface. Now, if you're using blue tape, blue painter's tape, you know what blue paper, painter's tape is, right? Everybody's seen that, right? They also have green painter's tape and yellow. Green and yellow don't work. <laughs> won't stick to glass well enough. It might stick to a wood plate. It might stick to other types of material like a plexiglass plate, but it does not stick to glass very well. Only the blue sticks well to glass. Again, your mileage may vary. You may find green painter's tape that works great for you. Uh, some of the masking tape works great. Uh, blue tape works best for me because blue tape uh, sticks well to the glass and the part sticks to the blue tape. I can also find blue tape that is 12 inches wide which is really cool, except when you're printing small parts, right? You pull it out and you put it on the build plate and you print this part that's this big around and you pull it off and you tear it. <sighs> you're going to take the whole thing off and throw it away. So if you use the two inch wide, right, and you print a small part and you tear it, not a problem. You pull that one strip out and you put another one down on top of it. See, trade-offs. Think about those kind of things. Um, also, the filament itself. I've had spools of filament that work great with certain build treatments, versus, uh, build surface treatments, and from the same manufacturer, other rolls that don't. So I've got some from MakerBot that I've got a sticker on the side that says you must run this at 230. Other ones say 215. Other ones say only works with blue painter's tape. You have to experiment with it. You don't want to throw those out. Those rolls of filament can be like 50, 60 bucks, right? can't throw them out. So, but if once you figure out what works with them, you're fine. Now, not all of them are like that. Generally, like if you buy from MakerBot or Matter Hackers, and you figure out what works best, whether you buy more, it's usually the same settings. You really don't have a problem. But every once in a while, you run into it. With MakerBot, it's almost always the yellow PLA. <laughs> There's something about the yellow PLA filament from MakerBot that it's just not stable, I think. Uh, but that's my experience. Yeah, you know, you may have different... So what about this filament? You come in generally two sizes, 1.75 millimeter or 3 millimeter. Whatever your printer uses is what you're going to have to use. Now, the reason why I don't have an Ultimaker or a Lulzbot is they both use 3 millimeter filament. And all of my printers use 1.75. I can convert them if I want to, but keep that in mind. You know, if you pick one, you're not necessarily stuck with it, but if you have a huge investment, if you have a rainbow set of colors in your cabinet, and you decide you want to get three millimeters, that 1.75 filament's not good to you anymore. So think about that. Uh, there is a wide range of filament materials available. Stock on hand ten, tends to ebb and flow. Even matter hackers sometimes are out of certain types of filament. Um, uh, just be aware of that. If you're doing something, a special project or something, make sure you order it ahead of time. Uh, and um, I think in general, we need better filament handling capabilities. So actually loading the filament, uh, knowing when the filament is uh, real is low, although some printers have that capability. 
uh, that, that could be helpful. Uh, joining the filament, you know, usually when they run out of filament, you have to take the remainder out, reload it, possibly prime the printer, and restart your part or resume your part. That procedure could be a lot better, I think. I think it really needs to get to the point, and I don't see why it can't, that your printer goes ding, and you put new filament in it, you push a button, it self-loads and goes. The MakerBot printer is one of the reasons they went to the extruder they have, is they, they claim that it does that. I'm here to tell you that it works eh, sometimes, but usually not so good. They need some more work. Uh, aesthetics. Oh, this is one of my pet peeves. Consumer printers, some consumer printers, are designed to look nice. So, have anybody heard of a Dremel printer? Dremel? Like the Dremel tool? They make a printer that the outer case looks wonderful. And there are other types of printers out I should have put some pictures on there. I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> they look great on the outside. But on the inside, maybe not so much. They spent too much time on aesthetics. So, I... A lot of them look like something you'd find at Best Buy or Target, you know. Like it looks like the glossy kind of thing, and, and I guess I'm too old school. I like to see a machine. It's a robot, right? I want it to look like a robot. Uh, professional printers tend to be more utilitarian, and some people like Ultimaker or MakerBot make a fairly fancy looking one. But uh, see me, see and see, if you remember the Delta printers? I mean, they look like a tool. And that's, that's exactly what they are. So I tend to shy away from that, but it, again, you, Whatever you like, that's great. Um, it's, I don't like ones that require different size screwdrivers and all that to work on. You know, I, I prefer one that I can work on with a single set of tools. Uh, but it's a sad reality of the consumer-grade business. For instance, if you need to fix your iPhone, right? How many people have had to fix their iPhone? Okay. How many fix their own iPhone? Okay, that's a lot of work, isn't it? That thing is not made to come apart. You can get it apart. Is not made to come apart. MakerBot's the same way. Not so much the Ultimaker. You can those are work, you can work on those. MakerBot, there are a lot of screws hidden behind those panels, and when you try to pop them off, it's kind of like taking the panels off in your car, or you break three of the tabs off when you're trying to get it off. That's how the MakerBots are. So if you want a printer that you want to be able to work on, you might reconsider that MakerBot. Uh, so that's a little pet peeve there. All right. So what what can we do to get the most out of our 3D printer? Well. We have to realize that owning and operating a 3D printer requires time, effort, and patience. With underlying patience three times. You need a lot of patience. Don't try to chase the perfect printer with money. You think, well, if I just bought that $3,000 Ultimaker, I wouldn't have this problem with that $1,000 Prusa. False. You may have worse problems because the credit card bill may come next week. Right? Uh, so don't try to chase that. The less expensive models sometimes outperform the more expensive printers. Uh, not always, but sometimes they do. I mentioned the print speed. Here's the issue with print speed. It's a huge trade-off. If you want something to print quick, you have to print it fairly densely. And uh, fairly dense. In other words, the layers have to be fairly thick. The thicker the layers are, the more rough the image looks or the, the part looks. The finer you want it, the lower the print the print layer, the better the part looks. It's still going to have that striate, you're still going to see layers, but it, you won't see it from a certain distance. Okay? So if you look at the picture on the front of my book, it looks like a fairly well-printed part. And if you get close, you can see some of the striations, but uh, this is printed on a medium level um, thing. But to print it on high resolution could take many times more. It could take you six, seven, eight hours to print something out on low resolution, only take 45 minutes. So you have to balance that trade-off. Uh, and perform regular maintenance. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> Maintain your printer. Adjust it. Whatever needs to be adjusted, whatever needs to be oiled, whatever needs to be cleaned, make sure you do that. These are very finicky uh, systems. They can cause all kinds of problems if you don't do proper maintenance. All right, so what does it take to become proficient? Again, learn and understand the capabilities of the 3D printer you bought. What filament materials was it designed to use? What do you want to use with it? What is the print speed? What is the quality that it, they, they expect? Uh, check the internet forums, see what other people are experiencing with these things. Um, work with your printer often. Use a systematic approach to solving problems. Fix one thing at a time, verify, and move on. Same kind of thing. And did I mention you should maintain your printer? Right, let's look at some examples. Um, 
poor first layer adhesion. In other words, it won't stick to the build plate. The part lifts, it gets knocked off after a while, or it appears to be what? Now, the reason why it gets knocked off is because the part itself usually warps, and the print head comes by and hits it and snaps it off. Uh, usually, you don't see that until well into the print. Uh, so the problem is the first layer is losing adhesion. The part's not sticking to the build plate. What can you do? There's a long list of things to do here. Uh, now, this is not a do this first kind of list. These are the areas that you could explore. Things like cleaning your print surface. And you'd be surprised how many times I've gone in and seen a print surface that is just horribly pitted and whatnot. It's like, uh, do you really expect anything to stick to that? Uh, lowering the first layer height. So first layer height, most people set to be whatever layer they want, like 0 0.3. Half that. <laughs> Make sure you squish that filament down onto the print surface. Um, turn off your fans for the first. If you're using filament that requires cooling, turn them off for the first few layers. Increasing the temperature of the build plate can sometimes help. Increasing the temperature of the nozzle can help you know, at, for the first few layers. Slowing print speed on the first layer. Now, that one works more often than not. Just half the speed. You know, print it really slow and, and then resume it. Uh, use a raft. Okay? If your print surface will handle a raft well and your software will generate one well, use that. Um, probably at the last, near the bottom, look at those alternative surface treatments. But more importantly, think about your environment. If you've got your 3D printer stuck next to an open window and you're having adhesion problems, close the window. Okay? Or if you've got it set like uh, underneath an HVAC system, right? Move it. Because <laughs> all those extra air currents, the temperature changes are going to affect that printer. It's very sensitive to that kind of stuff. Room fans, turn them off. Uh, those kind of things. Um, here's another one, stringing. This is very, very common. So you get the part, and let's say it's a complex part. It has different, you know, I don't know, nodules or whatever. And then what you get it out, and it looks great, except there's strings from various points. And it's got this, like, it's fuzz on it. And that happens a lot. It's, sometimes they're called threads. And it happens when the nozzle lifts off of one part and moves to the other. The filament is still dripping, if you will, and it causes a string. Okay? How do you fix it? Well, there's a number of things. Lowering the temperature of the nozzle. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of the... Uh, um, surface, uh, first layer. Increasing fan speed to cool the, the filament faster. Slowing the print speed helps. Changing the size of your nozzle can help to match the, whatever you're trying to do. And calibrating your extruder. A lot of times stringing is caused because you're over extruding. You're putting too much filament out at one time. Yes, you do have to calibrate your extruder. And the, calib the formula for calibrating your extruder includes the size of the filament. So... That's an interesting thing to do. Under extrusion. That maybe you're printing a part, and I talked to someone who, who was trying to print a whistle, and the, the walls of the whistle were too thin. And that's under extrusion. So it doesn't form a good solid, or it doesn't, it's, it doesn't form a, uh, uh, you know, a, a solid. So how do you fix it? Increasing the flow rate of the extruder. It's not extruding enough. Lowering the nozzle temperature can sometimes help. Raising it if it's getting clogged, that's a, that's a different issue. So sometimes under extrusion can lead to clogs. So it just stops extruding altogether. That's a case where you've got the temperature perhaps too low. Uh, calibrating your extruder <laughs> will do that same thing. Okay, so tips and tricks for 3D printing. Uh, most, I can't stress this enough, the number one thing you could do to help yourself is to make sure your nozzle is set at the right height to start with. So these two photographs, the one on the left shows a properly adjusted one, the one on the right shows an improperly adjusted one. What you want to do, and this, this sounds like voodoo, okay, but you take a sh typical sheet of paper, not your high quality uh, resume type printer with all the threads and all that, just a regular piece of notebook paper. Some people use yellow post-it notes, okay? And you lower the, you set your print nozzle height to the, where it, the Nozzle just touches the paper, and you can pull it out and push it under. Now, not so much that you can easily do it, and not so much that you really have to pull to get it out. That's a very sensitive kind of thing. But here's the trick. Do it when your nozzle is clean. <laughs> okay? you got some filament that are dripping out, and they always do after a print. Clean that off and make sure. See, that's a clean nozzle, right? And make sure you do that with a clean nozzle. The other thing is... You're, that's part of the procedure to tram your build plate. So you're going to have to do it when you tram your build plate. Why not do it at the same time, right? 
so you're going to want to do that at multiple places on your build surface, not just the center, because the build plate could be concave or convex. And I, that delta printer that I like a lot has a problem. It's convex. So there's, there's not exact center, but it's kind of like in one quadrant is a little higher than the other. And I had to adjust for that. It's the glass. That's what is the difference. The glass is not perfectly flat. That's another myth in 3D printing. Glass is always perfectly flat. Wrong. What is glass? Any, any physics students here? What's glass? It's a liquid, yeah. <laughs> there are some types of glass, like borosilic, uh, yeah, it's a chemical, that, uh, uh, like Pyrex is made out of, that they form and that with machines and make it very flat. Uh, but even then, some of those can be a little, but regular glass is generally not flat. Uh, Check your nozzle temperature. Um, look at the manufacturer of your filament. See what they recommend for the temperature of the nozzle. Now that's a recommendation. Okay? They, they don't know what printer you're going to use it with, but they know that it works best in general at that print range. Then Matterhacker gives you a range. They don't necessarily give you one temperature. Try it out. Start in the middle of the range and see how it works. Um, when you get it uh, set correctly, you know it because your part will print consistently. So if it's... Um, if you're doing tall prints, sometimes uh, I like to print a small part beside it, like a cylinder or something like that. And what that will do is give the print head time to move and cool a little bit, because taller prints with too high a print, print uh, uh, nozzle temperature may cause the top layers to look melty kind of thing, or string. Uh, so you can work with that. Uh, find the sweet spot for your bed temperature. Now, this has to do with the type of uh, surface that you have, type of heater it has, and the type of filament you're going to use, as well as the print surface, <laughs> the surface treatment. So some, like PLA, I run between 58 and 60 degrees centigrade. Um, ABS, I run 115 degrees uh, centigrade. It just depends on what you're going to do. If you get it too high, the bottom of the print will flow out like this, and it'll call what we call elephant feet. And that's okay, because that usually means it's going to stick really good. But if you really wanted to perfect print a perfectly cu uh, perfect cube, like a replica of the board cube or something, and it has these elephant feet, it doesn't look too good. <laughs> you either have to cut them off or shave them off or sand them off or something. So if you see elephant feet, it's usually an idea that your bed temperature is too high. Um, printer adjustment. Remember that tramming thing I was talking about? Well, here's a graphic that kind of illustrates what's, what you're doing. If you have... Um, a Z-axis in particular that uses two motors, like the Prusa design. They have to be together. <laughs> they can't be you know, one higher than the other, one running faster than the other. Believe it or not, uh, particularly for DIYs out there, if you buy a match set of, of motors, stepper motors, some of those stepper motors might run slightly faster, slightly smaller, slower than others. Okay, particularly if you buy commodity, meaning from Asia. <laughs> Hint, hint, okay? Uh, not Japan. The Japanese stepper motors are very, very pre uh, precise, so watch for those. Um, ones you've never heard of and can't pronounce. Uh, but sometimes with like these, these designs, if they're not going exactly at the same time, they can cause issues. So at certain layers, the one side will get higher than the other, and you want to try to avoid that. Make sure all the bolts are tight on all the axis mechanisms. You know, if you grab a hold of the printer and shake it and something jingles, it should never jingle. <laughs> Fix it. Um, uh, patience is your greatest friend. Your patience will yield higher quality prints. That's the way it is. Just be patient. Work with it. Look at it as an experience. So, again, I'm trying to take you as a hobbyist, potentially, and say you really ought to attack it like an enthusiast because that's where you'll get the, the best enjoyment and the best results. Faced with problems, uh, approach it with a systematic uh, process to uh, fix it. And just remember, every print you print is an opportunity to learn more about your printer. And having printed thousands of parts and tens of thousands